Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, a self-taught pharma, physicist, and electrical engineer who conducts open source research in the fields of unified physics, radiant energy power systems, and the energy systems of the human body, plants, and soil. No new ideas that come up in my videos can be patented. Although a lot of my first videos have been about coils and radiant energy, I'm also a farmer. Uh, this is my farm here. Uh, so today I want to talk about how this science applies to soil science and my theories about radiant energy in the soil. So over the, the course of the last six months to a year, I've made thousands of these little radiant energy collector or supercapacitor cells um, that are made up of these three layers and exploring particularly the combination of ingredients being uh, carbon, silica, uh, different electrolyte materials and metal and how they combined to conduct radiant energy. So I'm going to be applying a lot of that logic and exploring the similarities with how these kinds of materials work in the soil and how I'm kind of applying that to organic biodynamic soil science or as I'm calling it in this video energetic soil science. So during my experiments with these supercapacitor or radiant energy collector cells uh, I discovered that particular pretty much any kind of metal um, but depending on the combination you're using in this case it's just aluminium but any kind of metal like iron copper any kind of trace element really they all have different properties but they will conduct some radiant energy if they're combined with a carbon layer uh, which acts as a kind of energy sink which I'll get a little bit into later um, so I thought about you know first how does that apply to the soil and I came up with well minerals in the soil um, metals in the soil and when we look at what's going on in soil science um, and where we find good soils in the world we always find them in these volcanic regions um, and we find that they have a high level of things like basalt granite uh, essentially paramagnetic rock dusts um, and so in this video and in a lot of my ideas on soil science, I'm going to be using those paramagnetic rock dusts as the metal, kind of the anode of the uh, supercapacitor or radiant energy collector cell, just using the comparison. Um, so that's the first ingredient. The second one, of course, is carbon. Um, and this is actually an activated charcoal in this capacitor. It would need to be moist to actually um, conduct energy through its separator layer except yeah I'm using charcoal and you find that you need this in combination with the metal to continuously induct energy um, and you know move it unidirectionally in one direction so thinking about this in the soil of course we've got things like terra preta biochar um, so many applications of charcoal that are showing you know that it's essentially a slow release um, structure that can hold, uh, you know, either fertilizer um, or energy or, uh, you know, work with paramagnetic materials. Um, you know, obviously in this case it's energy. In, in the case of biochar, we're soaking our charcoal um, in some kind of nutrient solution and then it's going to slow release it into the soil. Um, if we look at the Amazon rainforest and a lot of the research that's coming out, out about the soil there, it's this heavy black charcoal based soil so we can see the similarities there of um just charcoal having this ability to and carbon in general having this ability to absorb energy and then slowly release it uh no matter what that energy is um so carbon uh being polarized has a capacitance which is kind of what makes this work here it will induct a certain amount of energy through the semiconductive layer and then it will discharge it so how we're looking at how all of this works in the soil is we've got these volcanic materials like minerals metals i'm calling them volcanic materials of course they could come from other sources but i'm going to be exploring how they come from volcanoes and rocks um, and then we've also got charcoal carbon 
um, these two act together um, and have a, a certain capacitance that can store energy or fertilizer. Um, and then the third part that we have is this separating layer, uh, which in this case is made of paper uh, soaked in an insulative and electrolyte solution um, that creates this semiconductive kind of pulse through the collector. Um, and if you look at any application of semiconductors, if you don't know what they are, uh, it's always something, again, it's a, a dielectric material that has its own capacitance and when two plates on either side of it um, build up enough, you know, what we would call positive or negative charge generally to bridge that semiconductive layer, then it will create a pulse of energy through. And you can do this with crystals, you can do this with, um, in this case, uh, I believe potassium carbonate was what I used in combination with something I can't remember at this moment. But you're always using an electrolyte material, so potassium carbonate is white wood ash. Again, something we can get from volcanoes, our fireplace, something we can easily put in the soil, and it's well known um, that it can fix pH issues, and obviously that is raising this electrolytic content. So obviously in the case of these collectors, we would be connecting a, a load or a circuit, um, a power circuit to be able to rectify and um, store or utilize this energy. In the soil, our load is the plant. Um, so in a way, we're using minerals and metals to induct energy from the atmosphere, from the earth, which they certainly, it happens in this. Um, and we can see from EC readings that it is indeed happening on an electrical level in the soil as well. Um, it's commonly known and understood in hydroponics, but it's never really applied or not generally to organic soil science or, you know, biodynamics. Um, but we can see that the metal does, you know, particularly paramagnetic materials um, will induct energy from the atmosphere. The carbon will act as an energy sink or a nutrient sink or, you know, with its porous structure, it's um, low density, you know, it's low mass, it, it's negatively charged as they say, you know, it's attractive and it's got capacitance and room to store information or energy. So using that in the soil, it acts as a voltage regulator between, you know, something like this, you know, the basalt that I'm planning to use in the soil, this volcanic rock dust that has a high paramagnetic value um, and the plant, the carbon's acting as a voltage regulator, just as it does in a circuit, a supercapacitor or the many other applications of carbon in uh, electronics, we see that, uh, generally speaking, you'll be able to use a supercapacitor and the load will be able to draw what energy it needs from that capacitor. Um, and that is because of the nature of carbon, the way it works in this kind of uh, regulated way that it uh, takes as much energy as it can, stores it, and then it releases it to, um, I guess we could say, organic or electrical sources or anything with resistance um, that is requiring energy. And so, of course, all that being said, um, the answer to what the carbon element in the soil is, is, of course, biochar or charcoal. And uh, because I want to use it as an energy sink rather than as a slow release kind of uh, nutrient uh, crystal structure, you know, to, to hold and slowly release nutrients, I actually don't want to charge my biochar. I want it to be ne as negatively charged as possible. So as empty, as low density, as negatively charged as possible. So in the case of our semiconductive layer in the soil, we're looking at things like clay, which, uh, you know, this is a dielectric insulator. It is full of insulative materials that, uh, you know, have their own inherent charge that doesn't want to gain more charge or, you know, however we want to describe an insulator. And then they've also got these kind of uh, semiconductive pathways made up of these highly conductive materials like potassium carbonate, um, like different minerals and, and metals, like even carbon, which is conductive uh, throughout the soil, which create this semiconductor of effect where we've got a, a primarily insulative material. For example, you know, um, small particles of clay and semiconductive elements like minerals and metals in the clay 
and then on either side of that we've got uh, carbon and we've got this paramagnetic rock dust so just like our collector here we're trying to use them in combination to create an energetic effect so I've done some initial experiments on this um, before I started filming videos and had some really interesting results um, certainly where pretty much the more charcoal I used the better um, and certainly I had more success using a higher quality uh, biochar uh, that was made by a local provider here um, and it but it just seemed like I pretty much couldn't get enough at the moment my amendment rate for our field that I've come up with is about 6 kg per square meter which sounds absolutely enormous um, and of course you know these are just based on my initial trials which are, are inconclusive um, you know I certainly saw patterns but nothing that I particularly want to share I'm going to redo all of these trials um, for the channel later and some more kind of based on what I can intuitively understand about it now but it seems like we can just add more and more charcoal that's fantastic we get this dark you know terra preta kind of Amazonian looking soil um, there's a limit to how much basalt or um, decomposed granite you want to use so really I found about the same amount as charcoal or ideally half the amount of charcoal so I'm looking at around 3 kg of basalt per square meter um, as com compared to 3 to 6 kg of biochar ideally about 6 kg um, so then of course we have the clay as an insulator and then I'll be rechecking the pH of all of my soil plots as well um, to make sure that the electrolytic content of this insulative material like the, the clay and the silt and you know these other materials that aren't exactly inducting a lot of energy um, but they're also quite uh, I guess dielectrically stable they're you know they're happy with their own charge like a glass jar is they don't necessarily want more energy so they create this insulative effect so looking into the materials I'm going to be using for my experiments and in future videos um, I've got this biochar here uh, which I believe is uncharged and this is you can see it's just beautiful black grainy stuff this is made by a local supplier who really knows what he's doing um, and I can't get any more of it at the moment because he's currently upgrading his plant which is awesome because we're going to be able to get a really good supply of excellent quality biochar whenever we need um, but if you just compare it to for example this is just horticultural charcoal from a local hardware store and you can see you know it's these kind of like much harder denser chunks you can see that there's a lot more kind of porous light material here um, that all the volatiles haven't really been burned out of this exactly it's still you know just a little too hard not very porous so you can see that the quality of the charcoal is always going to make a massive difference because there's going to be a huge difference in the available surface area between these two materials so obviously recommending a high quality um, biochar or charcoal or making it yourself and I'm probably going to um, show you the method that we're going to be using in a future video as well just a simple cone pit burn style uh, method if you'd like to do it yourself if you don't have a good provider around um, and other than that our paramagnetic materials I've got here um, so this is some decomposed granite which is an inferior material to basalt in most cases um, because the granite just doesn't have that same kind of um, I guess metal content and paramagnetic value that you'd usually find in the basalt but if you can't find a good supply of basalt decomposed granite is certainly an option I've also had good results with that in my trials too so um, worth looking into but otherwise basalt so this stuff is generally called crusher dust or quarry dust you can usually buy it from um, just any place that kind of sells you know quarry products or from a quarry directly um, but it can be really variable in its paramagnetic value um, and the the guy who sold me this biochar actually got all of the quarries in the area tested and he found that this particular one here has a reading of uh, 3200 CGS um, which is actually really good even on a worldwide scale um, and there's another quarry locally as well um, 
it's just easier for me to get from this one that does one that's I think a 3600 CGS reading. Um, so the good thing about this product is that it's pretty much used as like a, a base for your tank or filling potholes on roads so it costs very little. Um, it's a really cheap available amendment and of course it is basalt, uh, you know, volcanic rock dust. Um, but the bad thing about it is because it is just used for this usually, you're not going to find a lot of information probably from the local quarry about its paramagnetic value. They'll have no idea what you're talking about. So it's potential that you'll have to test this yourself, get a CGS um, tester. I can't remember what the appropriate type is called um, for this, but I'm sure you'd be able to find it online or I can look it up if you ask in the comments. But um, yeah, you're, you're going to need to see if it has any value because some of the other quarries in the same state um, that we're in here in Australia that he tested had a paramagnetic reading of, of nothing um, or very, very little. So you can see that you can't just bang something in randomly. Um, most of the commercial varieties that I understand in the US and that, um, that sell, you know, this paramagnetic rock dust. I don't know how good they are. I don't think they're quite as good as this. So it's worth checking out your local area. Um, if you don't have basalt, check out uh, decomposed granite and check out the, uh, the, the reading on that as well to see for its paramagnetic value. But these are the two main materials um, that I need for my experiments. Um, and I'll be using just some regular organic compost as well to just help increase the, uh, the biomass, um, the organic matter in my soil because it's fairly depleted as well. This was just a conventionally farmed broad acre property before we converted it to organic um, and started our organic market garden here. Um, so there's a lot of repair work still to do on this soil but I'm hoping that these are going to move things along and I'll be showing some real trials um, using these materials. Um, of course you know, I, I may get a lot of people just saying, look, it's just the nutrient action happening between because, of course, this rock dust is loaded with uh, nutrients. Um, and that could absolutely be the case. I've got no doubt that there's always secondary actions happening. Um, but I am viewing this in the context of field theory um, and electrical science. And of course, these things do exist in the soil, um, just like they do everywhere else. So it's not far out research, but to my knowledge, um, these experiments are new, uh, and this is new territory, so I'm bound to make mistakes. It may turn out well, it may turn out good. Um, uh, well, that actually, they both sound good. It may turn out bad too. But at any rate, I'm gonna show you what really happens. Um, and just as a farmer, you know, what is gonna work? What grows produce better? How can we fix our soil degradation issues and, you know, not have to rely on all of these chemical inputs or the struggle that it is to sometimes be an organic farmer just trying to source real materials around you and how much input you have to put into the soil and it's a difficult profession so I believe it can be a lot easier and that we can find these cohesive ways um, to access these natural rhythms and um, explore the energetic science of the soil so thanks for watching and let me know if you've done anything similar, if you're a biochar expert, um, if you're a farmer and you're looking to kind of try this kind of stuff at home or if you know an agronomist who is dealing with this stuff, I'm always looking to follow others and kind of uh, push the science forwards. Thanks.